We will now move on to part two, which will focus on skill building. We will begin by discussing practical interventions for practice. During this first module of part two, we will review evidence-based approaches to trauma treatment. We will take a deep dive into seeking safety, dialectical behavior therapy, and trauma-focused CBT. We will then briefly review other trauma treatments, such as narrative exposure therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, and attachment regulation competency. Judith Herman, a seminal leader in the field of psychology and trauma, also author of the book, Trauma and Recovery, describes trauma and the relationship to voice as the ordinary response to atrocities is to banish them from consciousness. Certain violations of the social compact are too terrible to utter aloud. This is the meaning of the word, word unspeakable. Our first evidence-based treatment is seeking safety. It was developed by Lisa Najovitz, who was a third generation woman in her family who overcame trauma. While it was originally studied with women who had comorbid substance use and PTSD, it has now been adapted for many different populations, including adolescents. It is a present-centered treatment with focus on healthy coping skills. It is comprised of 25 standalone topics. It is flexible in terms of the number of topics, the order in which you review the topics, whether you conduct this in a group or individual format. It draws heavily on CBT, but also incorporates empowerment and personal growth elements. The overall goals of seeking safety are to reduce trauma and substance use symptoms, to increase safe coping in relationships, to increase safe coping in thinking, to increase safe coping in behaviors, and to increase safe coping in emotions. A patient's perspective on their experience of having co-occurring PTSD and substance use. The more I use, the more I won't feel anything. The pain is so bad, you just want to die. There is no other way out. If you talk about it, it will hurt too much. So instead, keep it a secret. No one will know. In this slide, we will review the key principles of seeking safety. Number one is safety is seen as the overarching goal to help clients attain safety in their relationships, thinking, behavior, and emotions. That is, it is an integrated treatment model. That is, it works on both PTSD and substance abuse at the same time. Third, there is a focus on ideals to counteract the loss of ideals in both PTSD and substance use. And there are four content areas, cognitive, behavioral, interpersonal, and case management. As stated, seeking safety has four content areas and CBT is at its core. It's the anecdote for powerlessness and a lack of control inherent in the co-occurrence. The first content area is cognitive, where the goal is to shift meaning systems towards self-respect and adaptation. That is, PTSD does not mean crazy, but rather overwhelming emotional pain. Substance abuse does not, does not mean bad, but rather a misguided attempt to solve a problem. Identification of beliefs and restructuring, particularly around the function of substance use, cognitive distortions such as deprivation reasoning, beating oneself up, and time warp are addressed. There's also a behavioral content area where one commits to action through the behavioral bottom line, where real action, no matter how small, is essential. Weekly commitments signify one concrete step to promote healing, and no matter what happens, you can cope. Never, never, never give up. 
The third content area is interpersonal, where the goal is to maximize the presence of supportive people and let go of destructive people to help support our adolescent's recovery, to help communicate honestly when safe, to work on boundaries, to notice extreme relationship dynamics that may re-evoke trauma or substance use, such as overcompliance, enmeshment, friends inviting them to use. This content area also focuses on recognizing that adolescents can only change themselves at this point. Trying to change others while early in recovery is not productive or safe. Finally, the last, the fourth content area is case management, where we need to build an adequate treatment base and it takes a village. So building a multi multidisciplinary team and resources. As stated, Seeking Safety has 25 treatment topics, and here this slide outlines interpersonal topics such as asking for help, healthy relationships, behavioral topics such as grounding, red and green flags, respecting your time, seven cognitive topics such as PTSD, taking back your power, integrating the split self, and four combination topics, such as the life choices game and safety. Seeking safety can be implemented individually or in group settings. Um, the therapist can choose if running groups that they are open or closed, time limited or ongoing. Usually there's a structured format where the group will start with a check-in, review a quotation, review the session topic, and check out. Patients are also encouraged to make behavioral commitments each week to move forward in their recovery. Sample topics of seeking safety may include the topic of asking for help, where we explore help from others as essential to recovery and discuss effective ways to ask for help. Or red and green flags, which is identifying the signs of a downturn, which are red flags, early on, and upturns, which are green flags, related to active recovery efforts. Honesty. Both disorders involve secrecy, lies, denial, and avoidance, and this leads to shame and guilt. Another sample topic is around recovery thinking where the goal is to become more aware of thoughts associated with PTSD, substance use, and recovery. Next, we will talk about trauma-focused CBT, or TF-CBT. This was developed for use with children and has later been adapted for use with adolescents. I have also included here a screenshot of the TFCBT website where you can get more information on training. Each TFCBT component includes graded exposure to the child's traumatic experience. The intensity of the exposure incrementally increases as the child and parent systemically move through the hierarchy. Practice stands for psychoeducation, relaxation, affect regulation and modulation, cognitive coping and processing, trauma narrative, cognitive processing of the traumatic experience, in vivo desensitization, conjoint parent-child sessions, and enhancing future safety and development. TFCBT also includes optional grief components. If grief is part of the child or adolescent's trauma, we would provide psychoeducation on grief, on grieving loss. We would talk about preserving positive memories, as well as redefining the relationship with the deceased and committing to the present.
TFCBT views parents as a central therapeutic agent for change. So working to establish the parent as the person the adolescent turns to for help in times of trouble is integral. We explain the rationale for parent inclusion in treatment, not because the parent is part of the problem, but because the parent could be the child's strongest source of healing. We emphasize positive parental coping skills, enhance enjoyable child-parent interactions, maximize perception and reality of effective parenting through empowerment, self-care, and focusing on strengths. Common parental issues in child traumatization that may be, need to be addressed in TFCBT include inappropriate self blame and guilt, inappropriate child blame, overprotectiveness or overpermissiveness, and parents' own trauma and PTSD symptoms. Please click on this link, which will take you to Dr. Joan Kaufman of the Department of Psychiatry at Yale University discussing the different stages of trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, or TFCBT, the best evidence-based intervention for children who are, who are having impairing reactions to traumatic events. Trauma-focused CBT is the treatment that's been developed for children with post-traumatic stress disorder that has the strongest evidence base to date. It has multiple components. The first component is psychoeducation. And I think first and foremost to say is that it involves both the parent and the child. So the child's not going into a room by themselves and having play therapy. Um, but the first thing is that both the parent and the child need to learn what are normal trauma responses. For individuals with a history of trauma who might meet criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, it can be a very unnerving experience. You frequently have flashbacks. You may hear the perpetrator's voice. You have trouble sleeping, trouble concentrating. You may feel cranky and irritable. And to understand that these are all part of a syndrome and common experiences for people who've been through the type of things that you went through in and of itself is um, is therapeutic and it also helps the parent make sense of kind of what the kid is experiencing um, and understanding that trauma triggers often elicit some negative behaviors so if a child's been exposed to domestic violence yelling can be a trigger running into a perpetrator is often going to elicit extreme anxiety and might also elicit irritability so starting to get a catalog of what are those things that elicit these symptoms um, helps you begin to get control of it so psychoeducation is the first component the second is skills building. Um, being able to develop a sense of skills to um, deal with extreme anxiety, relaxation training, thought stopping techniques for um, recurrent memories. And the training and skills the parent wants are how do I manage the child when they get irritable or they may be oppositional or they don't want to sleep? What are some skills that I can use that can help them manage those behaviors and not have things escalate? Um, once there's a sort of set of skills and feeling like some sense of mastery, um, then the next major component is the trauma narrative, which is basically a revisiting of the, the trauma, telling the story, and also the cognitions and the thoughts that go with it. One of the core symptoms of PTSD is avoidance. And there's that sense of, I'll be fine if I just don't think about it. But the reality is, is it comes back, um, and our experiences shape us. And by taking it out of the box and examining it, it allows us to pack it up and really put it away. If we just shove it in there, you can't really close the suitcase. And it's important that oftentimes, um, when things have happened to you, how you make sense of it affects how you feel about yourself. I don't remember what, I remember one adult saying to me that she couldn't remember what she did that made her father want to choke her. And the reality is, is there's nothing that justifies a parent choking a child. But yet she had this sense of, I'm really not worthwhile. And so taking out and examining what are the thoughts that you have as to why things happened, um, it's really, uh, it is it's called trauma-focused CBT because it does have cognitive behavior therapy elements where you look at the cognitions and how that affects your emotions and how that affects your behaviors and you make those links. And then lots of times you can 
realize that the way you made sense of the horrible things that happened to you, it's not because you were a bad person, it's not because you deserved it, it's not because you should have been able to stop it and you couldn't have, um, that you can then put these things away without all those negative thoughts about yourself. Um, after the trauma narrative is creative, and it can be done in multiple ways um, with actually writing a story, or some children do it with cartoons or drawings, um, it's something that's shared with a caregiver. Um, and it's a really important process that these are not experiences and thoughts that are alone in the child's head, but that the parent and the child have a way of talking and communicating about these things. Um, so over time, TFCBT has been found to lead to the reduction not just in PTSD symptoms, but in behavioral symptoms with these gains really um, maintained over time. And it really, um, in the state of Connecticut, since we have implemented trauma-focused CBT, the number of kids in the Child Protective Services system needing inpatient psychiatric care has gone down enormously. Before, system-wide, we were offering this treatment about 65% of child psychiatric inpatients were kids who were involved in the system due to abuse or neglect. It's now down to about 30%. And I think um, addressing the trauma symptoms really has allowed an enormous number of children to kind of get back on track and be kids again. Do you some Dialectical behavior therapy, or DBT, is an empirically supported treatment for BPD developed by Marsha Linehan. It was initially developed to address suicidality and self-injury, and it's now used across a variety of race, ethnicity, SES, sexual orientation, and it has been adapted for the treatment of suicidal adolescents with impulsive disruptive behaviors, mood swings, self-injurious and suicidal behaviors, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, substance use, poor coping skills, among others. DBT combines cognitive and behavioral change strategies with Eastern Buddhist Zen philosophies of awareness and acceptance. It has utility in treating chronic or treatment refractory um, behavioral health problems. It is principle-based rather than protocol-based, so it can be used flexibly, and it utilizes an active, present, focused treatment model. As stated earlier, the fundamental components are change with acceptance. Change strategies include self-monitoring, goal setting, reinforcement, skills training, cognitive restructuring, among others. Acceptance strategies, including learning to cope with situations not under the person's control, and enhancing comfort with ambu ambiguity and change. DBT works off of five core problem areas for adolescents. Confusion about self, impulsivity, emotional instability, interpersonal problems, and adolescent family dilemmas. The DBT skills that target those areas include mindfulness, distress tolerance, emotion regulation, interpersonal effectiveness, and walking the middle path. The biosocial theory states that one may have emotional vulnerability because there's biological dysfunction within the emotion regulation system in addition to an invalidating environment. And that combination leads to per pervasive emotional dysregulation, which may display itself in emotional instability, impulsivity, and emotional confusion. Part of the biosocial model is emotional dysregulation, which displays itself into high sensitivity, high reactivity, and slow return to baseline. Biological vulnerabilities are exacerbated by invalidating environments. Growing up in a context where upon emotions, perspective, voice are not validated, accepted, or heard, individuals learn to suppress their emotions their voices become silenced. External events outside the family, 
such as experiences of loss, trauma, chronic stress, are also examples of invalidating environments. There are four stages to DBT. Stage one aims to reduce out of control behaviors and severe problems in living. Stage two focuses on emotional experiencing. Stage three involves solving problems of everyday living and improve the enjoyment in life. And stage four achieves transcendence, completeness, and build a capacity for joy. Therefore, DBT's treatment hierarchy targets first and foremost life-threatening behaviors, then treatment interfering behaviors, then quality of life interfering behaviors, and finally skills generalization as target four. The idea of a dialectic is central to DBT. The definition of a dialectic is the existence or action of opposing forces and concepts. And the central dialectic of DBT is that of acceptance versus change. This model is useful for us therapists to balance pulling for change with acceptance of the difficulty of changing and is useful in addressing treatment ambivalence. Examples of dialectical statements include, you did not create all of the problems you have right now, and you have to take charge of working to make them better. You as a parent are tough and you are gentle. Eating is very difficult for you right now and you still need to eat. You want to lose weight and you don't want to be sick. Here, we validate the valid, which is to understand and accept, but validation is not agreeing. We do not validate the invalid. The middle path is moving away from either or to both and statements. A dialectic is also a synthesis of oppositions, where two opposites can both be true. It also begets the question of what is being left out. It's helpful for us to establish truths on both sides rather than disproving an argument. It's like the yin and the yang. It's a synthesis of extremes. Core DBT assumptions are people are doing the best they can and people need to do better, try harder, and be more motivated to change. Common DBT dialectical dilemmas with adolescents and caregivers may include parents holding on too tight and forcing independence too soon, making light of problem behaviors, and on the other side of the dialectic, making too much of typical adolescent behavior. Too loose versus too strict. And here, we help families find a middle path. There are four modules to DBT. Mindfulness provides a framework for teaching the difference between thoughts, emotions, and the values of each, and prepares our clients to use other DBT skills. It is therefore the core DBT skill. Emotion regulation, interpersonal effectiveness, and distress tolerance are the other three modules. It is believed that DBT is effective because it breaks down complex concepts into teachable skills that patients can understand and access when in crisis. Narrative exposure therapy is a treatment for trauma disorders, particularly in individuals suffering from complex and multiple trauma. It has been most frequently used in community settings and with individuals who experience trauma as a result of political, cultural, or social forces. Narrative exposure therapy is distinct from other treatments in its explicit focus on recognizing and creating an account 
or testament of what happened in a way that serves to recapture the patient's self-respect and acknowledges their human rights. For many, the knowledge that she or he will receive a written biography at the end of treatment is an incentive for treatment completion. Often, small groups of people receive four to 10 sessions of narrative exposure therapy together, although it can be done individually. It is understood that the story a person tells himself or herself about their life influences how the person perceives their experiences and well being. Framing one's life story solely around the traumatic experiences leads to a feeling of persistent trauma and distress. Attachment, self regulation, and competence, or ARC, is a framework for intervention with youth and families who have experienced multiple and or prolonged traumatic stress. ARC identifies three core domains that are frequently impacted among traumatized youth and which are relevant to future resiliency. It's designed to be applied flexibly across child and family serving systems. It provides a theoretical framework for principles of intervention and a guiding structure for providers. It is designed for youth from early childhood through adolescence, as well as their caregivers or caregiving system. ARC's numbers of sessions can range from 12 to 52. ARC has multiple modalities, which can be done individually, group, family treatment, workshop style, milieu intervention, and home-based. This approach is grounded in theoretical empirical literatures, including attachment theory, child development, traumatic stress impact, and factors promoting resilience. The final evidence-based treatment we will review is called Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, or ACT. The primary components of ACT include accepting thoughts and feelings about ourselves, which are essentially not controllable, choosing a direction in life that involves identifying what you value and what you want your life to stand for, and taking action and steps towards realizing your valued life goals. Acceptance and commitment therapy for teens can help them learn to be more accepting of life's difficulties and reframe negative thoughts and feelings. An example of practicing acceptance is around the concept of pain. Pain is a natural part of life and we need it. So then how do we deal with it? There are two pathways. There's the acceptance pathway and the non-acceptance pathway. Acceptance would acknowledge that pain exists that we are experiencing pain and that we are willing to approach the pain, to let it go and to move on. And that leads to healing. The non-acceptance path would be to look for ways to avoid, numb or deny the pain's existence. A willful path leads to misery, to maladaptive coping and ultimately to suffering. The main message is that we need to go through the hurt and the pain to get to the healing. We will now move to our second module of part two, which explores skill building and interventions for practice, which we will begin by reviewing self monitoring. Our goal is to help our clients build a coping toolkit and real-time self-monitoring is part of this toolkit. Self-monitoring highlights key trauma behaviors, feelings and thoughts, and the context in which they occur. It allows these experiences that may seem automatic, habitual, and out of control more amenable to change. We are all creatures of habit. We often go about our day without thinking or being unaware of much that goes on around us. And while this may be useful in some situations, other times this lack of awareness may make us feel as though our thoughts and emotions 
are completely unpredictable and unmanageable. Self-monitoring helps us to address this. We also want to help our clients acknowledge that it may be hard initially to separate experience into thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations. However, the more our clients can separate these experiences from one another, the better they will be able to identify them when they occur. A mantra in my therapy is always practice, practice, practice. One way to do self-monitoring is through a DBT diary card. This is one part of the DBT diary card. You can see on the x-axis that there are behaviors and emotions um, through which our clients will rate how intensely they're experiencing them. And you can see a key at the uh, middle to bottom that details what each number means. There's also the days of the week because we want our clients to check in with themselves around these feelings and urges every day. We will now shift to talking about mindfulness. Mindfulness is described as purposeful and non-judgmental attending to both internal and external experiences in the present moment. It has Buddhist roots in the practice of intentionally enhancing one's awareness and acceptance of each moment with quote, the aim of helping people live each moment of their lives, even the painful ones, as fully as possible. This cartoon is commonly used to show the difference between a mind that is full, such as the person's thought bubble on the left, versus a mindful brain, which is the dogs on the right. Through a process of sorting and simplifying, we can go from brain overload to mindful peace. The person on the left is chaotic, messy, overwhelming, unproductive, whereas the dog is calm and focused on one thing. The person is future focused, whereas being mindful is now focused. Mindfulness lets you enjoy one moment, task, or event at a time which is what the dog is doing. Mindfulness-based approaches are rooted in Buddhist traditions of awareness and acceptance, which includes an understanding that life entails suffering and that much suffering is inescapable, and also takes the position of seeing oneself and others as a human being and trying to do the best one can. As we mentioned, dialectical behavior therapy or DBT incorporates mindfulness as well as ACT or acceptance and commitment therapy. There are also mindfulness-based stress reduction and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. So mindfulness is used in many therapeutic modalities. Why engage in mindfulness? We engage in mindfulness to develop a heightened awareness, learn to be less reactive, and increase our ability to distinguish between a thought and an actual experience. That is, we build the muscle around self-regulation, self-awareness, and self-compassion. Mindfulness is available to us in every moment. Yet mindfulness can be hard to learn how to practice. We break it down into the what skills and the how skills. What do we do? We observe or we just notice our internal and or external sensations. We describe. We put a label on a feeling, state the facts as you observe them. 
we participate fully in the moment, jumping in and just doing it. How we practice mindfulness. We practice by catching and reframing our judgments and ungluing from our sticky Teflon mind. We one mindfully attend to the present activity and don't multitask. And finally, we do effectively, which is do what works to reach your goals. Mindfulness has overarching goals of reducing self-criticism through a non-judgmental stance, increasing awareness of internal sensations such as our emotions, staying in the moment rather than living in the past or the future, and doing one thing mindfully. In introducing mindfulness to our clients, it may be helpful to ask them to try three practical ways of practicing mindfulness, such as mindful eating, mindful walking, and mindful coloring. We're now gonna practice something called Everywhere Mindfulness 54321. So in this moment, I want you to bring your attention to five things you can see. Next, I would like you to think about four things you can touch. Three things you can hear. Two things you can smell. And one thing you can taste. Congratulations, you've just practiced mindfulness. I also often share with my clients that mindfulness is a paradox. It's the easiest thing in the world and the hardest thing in the world. So some tips for making mindfulness work for you is to set aside some time, practice any type of mindfulness you wish, start with the easy stuff, be kind to your wandering mind, and again, practice, practice, practice. We're now going to move on to the skill of grounding. Grounding is a form of centering that involves both connection to the external world and healthy detachment and distraction from internal experience. With eyes wide open, clients are invited to notice everything they can about the world in front of them in the present moment. By doing so, they recognize that they are safe. It is important to note that grounding is not relaxation. In fact, words like relax and close your eyes can be triggering for trauma survivors. Most trauma-informed approaches teach grounding skills, approaches that emphasize the, the development of skills to manage distress and to reconnect to emotions in adaptive ways include seeking safety, TBT, among others. We encourage our clients to engage in grounding because we remember that child trauma survivors often oscillate between being overwhelmed by emotion and being completely detached from it. So they may be in a di dissociative state or an emotional numbing state. And grounding can be a means of reconnecting to one's experience in a way that feels safe. Guidelines for grounding. You can do it anywhere and anytime. People won't even know you're doing it. Use it when triggered, overwhelmed with emotion, so for using a sud scale from zero to 10 over a six would indicate getting to an overwhelm with emotion when one is dissociating or at risk for self-harming behavior. Again, keeping eyes wide open, 
rating one's mood on a scale of zero to 10 before and after to see if grounding helped. Keep away from talking or writing about negative feelings. Again, we're trying to temporarily detach from the feelings. Staying neutral with our language, such as describing the wall is blue instead of I hate blue walls, they are sad looking. And finally, focusing on the present moment. There are three ways of grounding. Mental grounding, which harnesses focusing our mind. Physical grounding, which focuses on our five senses. And soothing grounding, which is about kindness and self-compassion. One way to practice mental grounding is to describe the immediate environment in detail. So having your client describe where they are, whether it's their bedroom or sitting in their car or on their lawn, to describe their environment in detail, colors, shapes, textures, what they see, what they smell. Another is to use imagery um, to create a barrier between themselves and their pain, such as turning the channel, so using the remote control to change the channel in their brain away from the pain, or to put their pain in a box and put it on a shelf for now. Sometimes our clients need help staying safe in the moment, and so we may ask them to give their name. So what is your name? Where are you right now? What is the date? And etc. to help them stay in the moment. We may also ask our clients to count or say the alphabet slowly or alternate counting and saying the alphabet such as 1A, 2B, 3C. We may also coach our clients to name facts to themselves such as name all of the presidents, name all the types of dogs you can think of, name all the cities that begin with the letter A. Another good mental grounding is to try to read something backwards, focusing just on the letters and not what it says. Again, the ideas here of the mental grounding is to use your brain to move away, to distract yourself from your emotional intensity. Examples of physical grounding are going to use the sensation of touch, such as running warm or cold water over one's hands, touching objects around them, digging their heels into the floor, carrying around a grounding object such as a smooth rock or frozen lemon, clenching and releasing their fists, so practicing a little bit of progressive muscle relaxation, walking slowly and noticing each footstep, left, then right, left, and right. Having our clients grab their chair tightly and noticing how their body feels in the chair. Or eating something slowly and describing it in detail. Examples of soothing grounding can include a mantra of a kind statement that they say to themselves, thinking of their favorites whether it's their favorite color, favorite animal, favorite food, favorite song, favorite movie. Thinking of people who our clients care about and who care about them, looking at their pictures. Sometimes it's helpful to visualize a safe place or repeat coping statements. Tips for making it work. Practice, practice, practice. Use the ones that work best for you. Do it for an extended period of time. Start as soon as you begin to feel in a negative mood. Make an index card and list your strategies and then create other reminders of your, of your skills. Create a recording of a grounding message that you can play to yourself when you need to.
We will now shift to talk about distress tolerance or crisis survival skills, in particular the acronym for the skill called ACCEPTS. Distress tolerance is the capacity to withstand exposure to aversive emotional or physical states, such as negative emotions or uncomfortable physical sensations. It is getting through a situation without making it worse. We coach our clients to grow an ability to tolerate and accept distressing life events in the moment rather than using maladaptive impulsive behaviors. Distress tolerance skills are essentially crisis survival skills. They include getting through the moment through distraction, through self-soothing, and through acceptance. They can be used, distress tolerance skills can be used widely with mood disorders, eating disorders, anxiety disorders, substance use disorders, personality disorders, among others. We all face situations that are out of our control that are difficult to tolerate, and that cause us to feel emotionally out of control. The goals of distress tolerance skills are to learn ways to accept and tolerate these out of control, painful events and emotions in the short term without doing things that will increase distress in the long term. We believe the ability to tolerate and cope with distress is an essential mental health goal. It also helps us to learn ways to soften the impact of upsetting events by distracting or soothing oneself. Ultimately, it helps to build self-confidence, agency, and resiliency in the face of life's painful experiences. There is an important relationship between distress tolerance and the concept of pain. First, pain and distress are inevitable, inevitable parts of life. They cannot be entirely avoided or removed. The inability to accept this immutable fact itself leads to increased pain and suffering. Second, distress, toler distress tolerance, at least over the short run, is part and parcel of any attempt to change oneself. Otherwise, Impulsive actions will interfere with efforts to establish desired changes. So distress tolerance teaches us skills for tolerating, dealing with, getting through, accepting the distressing events and activities in our lives. We aim to help our clients regulate their emotions so that they are better able to think clearly and problem solve when our client is at an emotional breaking point, maybe the worst has happened, or maybe it was just the last straw, then it is time to use distress tolerance. Perhaps distress tolerance will help manage the situation, such as a negative emotion in the short term, so that our client can problem solve in the long term. It may also help in accepting life as it is in the moment. All of these techniques are to give our clients a break from dealing with all the pain all the time. They haven't resolved the painful situation, but they have put it away for a while so that they can take a break and get a chance to live some part of their life without it. Today we will review three ways of practicing distress tolerance. Again, please note that DBT uses acronyms. Wise mind accepts, tip, and pros and cons are the three skills we will review. Accepts stands for different types of distractions, techniques that are designed to keep our emotions manageable until we can resolve the problem. On the next slide, I will go into more detail of, around each of these activities, contributing, comparisons, emotions, pushing away, thoughts, 
and sensations. Activities can be focusing on engaging in hobbies, watching a video, going for a walk, playing a sport, sport cooking, gardening, fishing, shopping. Contributing is about giving back, doing volunteer work, babysitting so a friend can go out, doing something nice or surprising for someone you care about. Comparisons are about comparing oneself to people coping the same as or less well than us. If you are going, if you are doing better than you were a year or two or five years ago, make that comparison. The idea is to compare yourself to others suffering what by perhaps watching weepy soap operas, reading about disasters. Some people find this helpful, others don't. I encourage my clients to be mindful around work, doing what works for them. Emotions. So using opposite to emotions. If you are sad or angry, watch a silly or funny movie and bust up laughing. Pushing away a distressing situation by leaving it mentally for a while. So we build an imaginary wall between ourselves and the stressful situation. Or imagine yourself pushing it away with all your strength. Perhaps putting it in an imaginary box and putting that box on a shelf for a period of time. Thoughts. We distract with other thoughts. So perhaps we count, we do crossword puzzles, we talk with one syllable only. And finally, sensation. We engage in an intense sensation, either intense cold sensation by holding an ice cube, for example. The next distress tolerance skill is called TIP. TIP stands for tip the ten temperature, intense exercise, parasympathetic nervous system, and paced breathing. When we're upset, our bodies often feel hot. To counter this, use cold temperature. Splash your face with cold water, hold an ice cube, or let the car's air conditioning blow. Changing your body temperature will help cool down, both physically and emotionally. Often, our clients may put their face in a bowl of cold water or hold a cold pack on their eyes or cheeks for about 30 seconds. Intense exercise. Do intense exercise to match the intense emotion. This will help increase oxygen flow, which helps decrease stress levels. So run or walk at a fast pace to jumping jacks. Exercise naturally releases endorphins, which will help combat negative emotions like anger, anxiety, or sadness. Next, paced breathing. Even as something as simple as controlling breath can have a profound impact on reducing emotional pain. Steady breathing reduces our body's fight or flight response. And finally, paired muscle relaxation. When you tighten a voluntary muscle, relax it, and allow it to rest, the muscle will become more relaxed than it was before it was tightened. The distress tolerance skills and tip will bring our clients closer to wise mind, where they will be able to make a constructive choice and cope productively. Some clients find it helpful to logically engage in writing down the pros and cons of either using a skill or not using a skill. For example, our clients may decide that when they are feeling triggered that they should use coping skills, grounding skills, and they will write down the pros and cons of that. They will also explore the pros and cons of not using skills, using other strategies, to try to escape the pain. Tips for making distress tolerance skills work. First, 
this isn't a magic wand intervention. So remind and encourage clients to practice, practice these skills when not in a moment of crisis, so they have muscle memory for when they need to. To find some of these distress tolerance skills and techniques that work for our clients, to practice them until they are part of their everyday routine life and that they can call upon them when they need them. Distress tolerance does not mean we encourage our clients to distract and avoid solving their problems. We can think of these as crisis survival strategies. Some of them will seem easy, some difficult. Out of these skills, they will probably want to try most everything and then pick some that especially work or apply for them. And try things that are new. Our clients never know what might be a help to them. We will now explore the module Understanding We will begin by engaging in our own self-reflection as providers. Engaging in this self-work can be an integral way to stay engaged and in tune with our roles of working with individuals and families with trauma. Those who work with trauma survivors may be affected by their clients' life experiences and narratives. Therefore, it is critically important to be aware of possible interpersonal and or situational factors that can put practitioners at professional risk. Even with the most effective self-care and coping, trauma work can impact us. Has anyone known someone who spent a lot of time exposed to people reporting sexual abuse or interpersonal trauma who became quote unquote jaded? Or maybe who became unable to watch certain kinds of movies or TV? Maybe they became hardened or insensitive. What happens if you're constantly bombarded by experiences of fear? Might you become more sensitized to it? How would you know? We need to continually self-monitor our responses to our clients with trauma and to ask ourselves, are we sure all this trauma work hasn't gotten to us? Research indicates that compassion fatigue is made up of two main components, secondary traumatic stress and burnout. For some, the negative effects of this work can make them feel like the trauma of the people they are helping is happening to them or the people they love. This is called secondary traumatic stress. It can lead to difficulty responding appropriately to our clients' feelings and or cause clinical mistakes and judgment, resulting from a failure to understand what the client is trying to express. When these feelings go on for a long time, they can develop into vicarious trauma. Secondary trauma and vicarious trauma can lead to a transformation of self. It may change how we view ourselves in the world. It will, may lead to problems with trust, control, intrusive imagery, safety, and intimacy. It, and it also can lead to symptoms of PTSD. When experiencing burnout, one may feel exhausted, overwhelmed, like nothing one does will help make the situation better. It can be too much work and not enough resources. It can be excessive demands in multiple areas leading to burnout. Factors that lead to burnout include increased job stress and workplace pressure, a lack of clarity about rules and policies, a lack of organizational commitment to counselor goals, worse counselor coping skills, greater client-patient distress, worse management supervision, lower professional status, a lack of intellectual stimulation, 
and unsatisfactory relationships with clients, client families, and other staff members. Being in the trenches with our clients can be both incredibly rewarding and meaningful, while also exhausting, behaviorally, cognitively, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. One way in which exposure affects people is the mirroring response. When we're involved with someone in an empathic way, our brain responds as if we are experiencing what they are, are experiencing, as if emotions and experience are transmitted to us. One common is experience is when you walk into a room and you can feel the tension. Other signs of burnout include the thought if nothing you as if nothing you can do will help, feeling like a failure or not doing your job well, being distant or feeling disconnected, having high levels of cynicism and mistrust, feeling as if you need to use alcohol or other mind-altering substances to cope. These are some, not all, of the signs of burnout. Signs of secondary traumatic stress, a more serious component of compassion fatigue, may include the following. Fear in situations that others would not think were frightening. Excessive worry that something bad will happen to you, your loved ones, or colleagues. Feeling easily startled, jumpy, or on guard all the time. Becoming wary of every situation, expecting a traumatic outcome. Perhaps physical signs like a racing heart, shortness of breath, and increased tension headaches, or a sense of being haunted by the troubles you see and hear from others and not being able to make them go away. Or perhaps the feeling that others' trauma is yours. Regular meetings with your supervisor or perhaps a peer support group during and after um, meeting with your clients can be a significant help in managing stress and compassion fatigue. But when signs and symptoms continue for more than several weeks or are truly bothersome at any point, it is important to seek out professional help. That is, the most insidious danger to clinicians is denial. Now we will shift to talking about skills for coping with compassion fatigue. An important part of assessing for compassion fatigue is understanding what you need from each other in terms of your team. Assessing your supports. Where will you get support? How will you get support? What type of support and when? Maintaining ongoing collaborative consultation. Being able to integrate different areas of expertise, a multidisciplinary approach, a holistic approach. Using your voice, especially if you feel that a differential diagnosis, for example, is important in conceptualizing and understanding your client. Knowing your role as, your, as an advocate for your client and then also to continually re-examine your own reactions with your work. <coughs> Trauma Stewardship is a book by Laura van der Newt Lipsky that openly acknowledges, validates, and discusses ways in which we can sustain ourselves in doing the hard work of trauma. Trauma stewardship refers to the entire conversation about how we come to do this work, how we are affected by it, and how we can make sense of and learn from our experiences. We are entrusted with people's stories and their very lives. There is honor, responsibility, and pain. Trauma stewardship helps us to find a way home to ourselves. It implores us to stay fully present in our experience, no matter how difficult, to use self-inquiry, self-exploration, compassion, and consciousness.
As stated, trauma stewardship acknowledges the effect of trauma exposure on the clinician. It also speaks to making room for one's own internal process and recognizes the role of our ego that motivates us to keep on in the work long after we may stop being truly available to our clients. It begets the question, how do we bear witness without surrendering our ability to live fully? Please click on this link to access Beyond the Cliff, a TED Talk by Laura Vandernoot Lipsky. This talk offers practical tools for cultivating the deep self-knowledge and systemic insights that are, that are at the core of trauma stewardship. In her talk, Laura offers us a window into the cumulative toll that can occur when we are exposed to the suffering, hardship, crisis, or trauma of humans, other living beings, or their planet itself. Eighteen years ago, I found myself standing on top of a very tall cliff, having what I would only come to recognize many years later as a near psychotic break. It would be fair for you to ask if I had always been that on edge, and the answer is no. But as many of you, I imagine, can relate to how I found myself on top of that cliff on that particular day was by way of a very long road. Like so many others, my childhood was filled with a lot of love and many challenges. Life came into particularly sharp focus for me when I was 10 years old. My mom, who was the healthiest person any of us knew, went into a doctor's appointment for what everyone thought would be a diagnosis of pneumonia at the worst and returned home having been told she had a very rare form of lung cancer. They gave her three months to live. She lived for three years, much of that time with one lung. And so she died when I was 13, and the sun rose and set with my mom, and I entered into my adolescence feeling if continuing to live wasn't going to be impossible, it was going to be highly improbable. So I navigated high school with a lot of overachieving. I spent my days getting straight A's and working three jobs, and I spent my nights planning on how I could end my life without causing my older brother, who'd always been my protector and my role model, too much pain. I did make it through high school, and then I landed in college, and I found myself sitting in one of those very large lecture halls, and my professor at the time, Professor Richard Applebaum, was talking to us about suffering on this one particular morning. In particular, he was talking about homelessness. And he was talking about it in a way that allowed time to stand still for me. He was building on what so many traditions have taught us for the beginning of time, really, that in life, it is said, there's equal measure of brutality and beauty, of pain and pleasure, of annihilating moments and of sublime moments. And yet there was a way he was talking about it, this whole conversation about equanimity that was completely new to me. So during those three years when my brother and I were taking care of our mom, we were surrounded by a number of very, very loving people and kind people who gave us a lot of support for appearing to be stoic, for seeming to be strong, and for holding it all together. And what Professor Applebaum was talking about on that morning is when one is engaged in suffering, there is so much more to it than holding it all together. So what I knew was I wanted more of whatever he had going on. So I went up to him after class, asked how I could help. He scribbled on a piece of paper the name and number of our local homeless shelter's director. And that's when I started volunteering at age 18, spending the nights regularly volunteering in a homeless shelter. I went on to work with all forms of trauma and always within this kind of larger backdrop of systematic oppression and liberation theory. And what I knew was that I was so grateful that I had found something that made sense to me and that I felt passionate about. What I had no idea and wouldn't know for years to come was to what degree having borne witness to the suffering of my mom and then the subsequent years of w bearing witness to so much suffering with so many people, to what degree that was taking a toll on me. And this is something that wise people have passed down for a long time and we know more and more about now because of the advances in neuroscience and the wonderful research that many of my esteemed colleagues are doing. But at the time, I had no idea about this cumulative toll. 
So one of the ways that the toll can show up is for those of you who are doing work. There are folks who do work, and as a result of the work you do, you might be exposed to things, either because of the content of what you're doing, but what a lot of my colleagues say is like, look, the work itself is the least of my concern. It's all my colleagues who put me over the edge, right? So sometimes the toll is because of the work. Sometimes the toll is because of the caretaking we do on our lives. Here she's saying, I feel like I need you less and less, Mom, now that I can make myself feel guilty all on my own. <laughs> so much of the toll we feel is because many, many, many of you are caretaking in your personal lives. You're caretaking those around you. You're at home tending for folks who are returning from wars, folks who are ill, people who are in need in the community. Sometimes the toll we feel is because of the suffering of other living beings. This is Chris Jordan's wonderful work. And sometimes it's because of what's going on ecologically on the planet itself. This is the work of Vance Friedenberg. He's one of the leading scientists looking at the six mass extinction. But what we know is that when humans are exposed to suffering, hardship, crisis, trauma of humans, other living beings, or the planet itself, there's a cumulative toll. And there's a toll on us individually, there's a toll on your immediate relationships, there's a toll organizationally for those of you who have this exposure in your work, institutionally, systemically, we see it in movements we're a part of, we're seeing it throughout all of our communities and society as a whole. She's saying, speaking personally, I haven't had my day and I've never met any dog who has. <laughs> the other piece of this that's very important, at least when I do this work, is it's always held in a larger context of systematic oppression. You know this so well, but a reminder that the degree to which you're impacted by the lives you're living and the work you're doing is intimately tied to the fact that we're in a society with so much supremacy. And if we're in a society where there's no oppression, there's no racism, sexism, homophobia, heterosexism, age, ageism, ableism, classism, and xenophobia, so much of the suffering we are tending to wouldn't exist, and the remaining bits that exist in life, we would all be affected by that so differently. I have no doubt that all of you have so much more insight and personal awareness than I did back in the day, and that for those of you who know what this toll is and when you feel this toll, either because of what's going on in your personal lives or on the job, that you're able to identify it. But I was not at all able to identify it. So it was about 10 years into my career when a critical mass of people started kind of getting up in my face doing that, hey, Laura, you're tripping. You should take some time off. And I'm sure somebody said something earlier than 10 years in, but I was very stubborn and successfully ignored them. But 10 years in is when there was a critical mass of people up in my grill really begging me to look at this. And what some of you will appreciate is that a number of those people were clients I was serving, which you can imagine is always so disconcerting. You know, <laughs> survivors of domestic violence living in a shelter who can't go anywhere, begging me not to come to work. So people were doing their due diligence, right? But at the time, I was so arrogant, I was incredibly cocky, and I was entirely self-righteous. I was doing God's work. You could either step up and help me do God's work, or you could step off. But I was definitely not gonna have a conversation with you about how I was affected by my job. And like many of you, possibly, I was raised in a number of traditions that implicitly and explicitly communicated, if you care enough about what you're doing, if you are down with your cause enough, if it matters enough to you, you're going to suck it up. So this whole conversation about how to sustain was not something I was engaging in. But finally, the pressure mounted. I caved. I didn't take any significant time off, but compromised. We took a short trip, went to visit our family who lived in the Caribbean. So on a particular day, we head out as a family on this hike, and we get halfway through our hike, and we summit what we wanted to summit, and there we are standing on the top of these cliffs, right? So the family's gathered around, tiny Caribbean island, standing on the top of these cliffs, looking out. The first thing I remember thinking was, this is so beautiful. The second thing I immediately thought was, I wonder how many people have killed themselves by jumping off of these cliffs. Right? And at the time, I worked at Harborview Hospital, which you know is the level one trauma center for the whole Northwest. So it wasn't my own suicidality at play anymore. It was because of the years of bearing witness to other suffering that naturally, instinctually, one starts triaging, of course, right? So you start thinking, where would the helicopter land? Does the helicopter land on the cliff? And would you belay down to the person on the beach? Would the helicopter actually land on the beach? Is there a level one trauma center in the Caribbean, you ask yourself? Do they fly you to Miami? Would they stop you in customs? You know, you kind of go through the whole thing, right? <laughs> So I said this out loud because I was merely presuming I was just giving voice to inevitably what was going to come up in a family conversation because who stands on top of a cliff 
and does not wonder where the nearest level one trauma center is. But apparently in my family, nobody was thinking that. So it got even quieter than it had been, really long, very uncomfortable pause happened, and ultimately it was my stepfather-in-law who said, are you sure all this trauma work hasn't gotten to you? And honestly, this was the first moment I had any insight into, you know, check it out. There are people who can go on a hike and not wonder where the nearest level one trauma center is. But I'll tell you, it wasn't me, it wasn't anybody I was hanging out with, right? Because one of the things about this toll is it's slow moving. It is very hard to gauge over time, individually and collectively, if we are being affected by what we're exposed to. And also what happens is we get very isolated. So this was one of those moments that maybe you've had where kind of everything starts flooding in, right? And then I was like, whoa, well, if this is the case, maybe it's also the case that there's people who still date out there in the world, and those people who date aren't doing bad background checks on everybody they date, right? <laughs> Maybe there's people who can go to a playground. It's just a lovely place for children. You're not worried about like head injuries or Amber Alerts hat, right? So, but this is what happens that over time, what you're exposed to affects your entire worldview. There's so many ways that we can be affected individually and collectively by exposure to vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, secondary trauma, many people call it many different things. But this exposure affects all of us so differently. What I have found through the privilege of getting to work with everyone from zookeepers to judges, school teachers to nurses, ecologists to activists, is that it is breathtaking the commonalities of how one is affected. Right? So some of the ways we find you feel like you're not doing enough, right? So here they're saying we just haven't been flapping them hard enough. So this is where you feel like you're not doing enough. You constantly feel like you should be doing more, right? Another one could be morale. So they're saying, I see you've done time, so working in a cubicle shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> So I work with organizations nationally, internationally, and one of the things we find so much is the morale, the very, very quickly eroding morale. Right. Here he's saying, I bark at everything. You can't go wrong that way. So hypervigilance, many people can relate to a sense of hypervigilance. This is where you lose your ability to flow in, you know, really fluidly in between your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous system. You become in kind of a hyper arousal. I had a colleague say to me, she was a child support enforcement officer, and she said to me, I can tell you which ones of my son's friends are going to grow up to not pay their child support. <laughs> And her son was five years old, right? <laughs> Here he's saying, no, not there, please. That's where I'm going to put my head. So exhaustion is something many people can relate to. And not the exhaustion before you work out, but this is an exhaustion where you are tired in your soul, you are tired in your spirit, you are tired throughout your bone marrow. All of your ancestors were tired people, <laughs> right? There is the avoidance. He's saying, no, Thursday's out. How about never? Is never good for you? This is where the best part of your day at work is where you don't have to do your job, right? And then there's the avoidance in our personal lives. She's saying, it's too late, Roger. They've seen us. <laughs> Cynicism, many of you can relate to. They're saying, but she'll come down eventually, and she'll come down hard. So what many of you might be able to relate to is not the pure cynicism, but the cynical humor, right? And then anger and rage. He's saying it's a new antidepressant. Instead of swallowing it, you throw it at anyone who appears to be having a good time. <laughs> and here he's saying, I can cure your back problem, but there's a risk you'll be left with nothing to talk about. So the other thing we see here is the externalizing that happens. When more and more people are asked to do more with fewer resources, we see this whole seduction to externalizing. So this is where you start saying to yourself, you know, I would actually be fine taking care of my loved ones if I could have different loved ones to take care of. Or people say, I would love coming to my job every day if my immediate supervisor would just retire, right? <laughs> And then there's blind spots that we have. So one of the things that we notice a lot that people have is blind spots. I'll share the story to illustrate it. This is a water bottle. It says the Oregon Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. It's one of approximately, you know, over 100 water bottles I have in my home that have been gifted to me like incredible programs that many of you are involved with, right? And every water bottle I have in my home has something stenciled on the side like this, which has, you know, domestic violence, sexual assault, HIV AIDS, infant mortality, flood, hurricane, tornado, tornado, tsunami, death, destruction, right? And I'm just thinking, this is great. I got water bottles. Every day is Earth Day here. This is fantastic. But what it also means is these are the water bottles that go with my kids to swim meets, basketball tournaments, <laughs> soccer games, right? And I'm not thinking anything of it. 
But then I was unpacking my child's lunch some time ago, and I noticed that at school she found the provisions to kind of hack over the word sexual, right? So she's not exactly old enough to know what sexual violence is. She's definitely old enough to know you're not sitting at the lunch table at school with a water bottle that says domestic and sexual violence on it, right? I don't know why, but I decided to tell this story at a very large conference of police officers, and when the break came, a police officer came up to me two centimeters from my face, 20 bucks in her hand, and said, go get your kid a proper water bottle. <laughs> so I feel like you know things have gone very wrong in life when you've got the cops giving you cash, instructing you on parenting, right? And then dogma and self-righteousness, okay? So here he's saying, your mother and I are separating because I want what's best for the country, and your mother doesn't. <laughs> And then addictions, which many of us can relate to. She's saying, of course I drink during the day. I'm way too tired to drink at night. <laughs> and numbing. So here he's saying, could we have the dosage? I still have feelings. One of the things I want to say to us about numbing, it is incredibly seductive with the volume and the intensity of suffering on the planet today. It is incredibly tempting and seductive to become numb. And what I want to offer to you is how critical it is that we continue to strive to cultivate our capacity to be present. One of the reasons we want so much to be present is we remind ourselves with everything that is out of our control every single day, one of the things that remains in our control at any given time is your ability to bring your exquisite quality of presence to what you are doing and to how you are being. That presence we know can interrupt the systematic oppression which is causing so much harm and can transform the trauma that is arising. It is very easy to get in that place of you have no idea what my life, if you lived here, if you did my job, if you saw what I saw, and that's when we call on our ancestors and that's when we call on so many people who have come before us who remind us that when they could not change anything external, they were able to shift everything as a result of where they put their focus. And again, I don't know any of you personally, but the assumption I'm going to make is none of us would go up against any of these folks, right? You're not going to, oh, Desmond, I know things got rough for you in South Africa, what with apartheid and all, but here in Washington State, we got a few things going on, right? Here he's saying, this is the barn where we keep our feelings. If a feeling comes to you, bring it here and lock it up. The other reason I want to bring us back to presence is I want to remind you that while I know we have so many different life circumstances, I believe we have a shared ethic of doing no harm. If you are numb, you will not be able to gauge whether or not you're doing harm. And if we believe in what Chief Self talks about with the web of life, or what Martin Luther King talked about with the single garment of destiny, you all know so well that there are so many parts of this web that are profoundly compromised. And many of you are bringing heart and soul to tremendous sacrifice to tend to parts of this web that are compromised. If the way you're doing that out there means in any way you are neglecting your immediate part of the web, cutting off circulation to your immediate part of the web, lighting your immediate part of the web on fire, it is not ethical practice, it's not integrity-based practice, it's not sustainable. The other piece with numbing out and what we've learned from so many people who've come before us and in so many traditions is you don't get to selectively numb. So if you're going to numb out your sorrow, you're also going to numb out any possible happiness you can have. If you are going to numb out the heartbreak, you're going to numb out any ability to survive noticing what is beautiful. And the other thing is your mind and body and spirit will keep trying to bring itself back to a full range of feelings of that whole equanimity and that spaciousness which means that's why you, know, you can work on coalition after coalition of peace building, and then you get in the lunch line or on the freeway, and you don't let anybody merge in front of you, right? And we defend that. We say how I conduct myself on that freeway or when I'm getting my food at lunch has nothing to do with the other work I'm doing. <laughs> Howard Thurman reminds us, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go and do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. So we remember that with the magnitude of suffering at play on the planet right now, we are in desperate need 
of folks who have the wherewithal and who have the courage to be present. We know from that place of presence, it is possible to aspire to do no harm. It is possible to transform whatever trauma arises, and it is possible to continue to work to dismantle the systematic oppression which is causing such a legacy of suffering. From that place of presence, we know that it is possible to metabolize whatever arises in life, the waves of life which will continue to present to us what they present. There is a way to metabolize that and integrate it so that over time you find that it contributes to your awakening. That the longer we get to walk on this planet, we find we have deeper compassion, vaster humility, and we are able to come up and out of the narrow places. And from that place of cultivated presence, we remember that it is possible to create and to sustain an ability to be truly transformative. Thank you. Let's review some self-care practices perhaps focusing on the four core components of resilience, adequate sleep, good nutrition, regular physical activity, and active relaxation, such as yoga or meditation, making time to learn about the people with whom you work, engage with your fellow workers to celebrate successes and mourn sorrows as a group. Take time to be alone so you can think, reflect, meditate, rest. Practice your spiritual beliefs or reach out to a faith leader for support. Take time away from the work when possible. Communicate with friends and family as best you can. Taking time for conversations will help foster feelings of positive regard toward yourself and others. Create individual ceremonies or rituals for example, write down something that bothers you and then burn it as a symbolic goodbye. Focus your thoughts on letting go of stress or anger or on honoring the memory, depending on the situation. Should she told them?
Compassion satisfaction refers to the sense of fulfillment you feel for the work you do. It can be a source of hope, strength, and ultimately resilience. It reconnects us with the rewards of our work. I would like you to take five minutes now to silently reflect on these questions. What sustains and keeps us in the field? Identify one aspect of your work that is rewarding. Consider, what made me choose this line of work? What keeps me going and sustains me as a person and a professional, given the challenges of my work? What strategies have made a significant difference for me and have allowed me to remain healthy and well in this career? If I were to do it all over again, is there anything I would have done differently? And then finally, can I think of a particular client whose story has profoundly touched me in a positive way? What was in, in that client's story that moved me? Again, please take five to 10 minutes to reflect on these questions and reconnect with your compassion satisfaction. This slide outlines four steps to wellness. Step one, take stock. Track your stressors at home and at work. Step two, find some type of work-life balance and self-care strategy. Step three, develop resiliency through relaxation training and stress reduction techniques. Step four, making a commitment to change. I include a quote by Laura van der Noot Lipsky here. Before starting your day, take a moment to literally stop in your tracks and ask yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? After you, you hear your answer, remind yourself gently that you are making a choice to do this work. Take a deep breath, breathe in both the responsibility and the freedom in this acknowledgement. We are now beginning our last module of this training on recovery. Recovery is truly an individual process and will look different for everyone. It is a process and through safety reflection, connection, and courage that is possible. Judith Herman, in her seminal work, Trauma and Recovery, talks about the big picture of trauma recovery, which depends upon empowerment, connection with others, and building trust, autonomy, initiative, competence, identity, and intimacy. Judith Herman's process of recovery starts with building safety, such as control of one's body, self-protection, organizing a safe and predictable environment. Then it moves to remembrance and mourning, such as telling one story, revising meanings, and working through grief. Lastly, it's about reconnecting with ordinary life with relationships and meaningful activities. Recovery is not linear, but marked by growth, setbacks, and learning from experience. It's about moving from destructive to healthy coping, which involves daily choices for health and safety. That means this process can be laborious Small steps need to be recognized and valued. Beware when we as clinicians feel, here we go again, holding on to the hope, remembering post-traumatic growth, which is a kind of transformation following trauma and holds that people who endure psychological struggle following adversity can often see positive growth afterward.
So as we conclude our presentation today, I leave you with clients' words of wisdom around their process of recovery. You are not alone. There are a lot of us out here. It's going to be really hard, but it's worth it. You are not permanently damaged. You're going to be okay. It's worth going on. Hang on. Don't let people discourage you. Once you tell, you stop being the victim, you have power. Always remember, it's not your fault. The fact that you were hurt doesn't make you any less of a person. Please access the brief quiz here. Thank you.